kindly administer the oath. Swear by the Almighty God. Swear by the Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give before this committee. That the evidence I shall give before this committee. Touching the matter in issue. Touching the matter in issue. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. So help me God. So help me God. Honorable Dr. Yao Osei Educhu. On behalf of the committee, I congratulate you on your nomination. You were earlier nominated and approved by this committee as the Deputy Minister of Education. Now you've been nominated for the position of Minister for Education. You are a member of Parliament. We know you. So, just give us a brief history of yourself, very brief. Then members will ask you questions relating to your CV and your work as we know it. Very brief. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Uh, my name is Yaosei, Dr. Yaosei Dichum, Dr. Yaosei Dichum, Member of Parliament for Abu Sunche. I attended Jati Angrican Primary Jati Anglican Middle School, Jati Pramsu Senior High School, Kumase High School, and undergraduate at Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology in Land Economy. And then in the U.S., I pursued a postgraduate diploma credential in education and master's in education management, PhD in education policy and administration. Thereafter, I taught for 10 years, developed charter schools for another 12 years, became the CEO, came down to Ghana, became MP, Deputy Minister, and now, by the grace of God, I'm in front of you. Yes, colleagues, here is our nominee. Here is Nilante van der Poel. We have had no activity since yesterday, so. Thank you very much. Honorable Chairman. Honorable nominee, first, let me ask, are you aware of Ghana government and Ghana education service policy directive that children must be taught in their local dialect from at least class one to class three? I just Honorable Chair. No, I just want to, are you aware of it? Oh. I asked, first, are you aware that there is an existing government of Ghana and the Ghana Education Service policy that children within certain areas must be tutored in their local dialect from class one to class three? I'm aware of a draft policy. Then let me ask you, has it come to your notice that in Greater Accra region, systematically, the Ga language is totally not being taught in schools? And some schools even writing to parents to notify them of their inability to teach their children in Ga because they don't have Ga and language teachers. Honorable Chair, um, I believe you are not talking about language of instruction. You are talking about learning the native language and, and teaching of the language as approved by Ghana Education Service, of course, depend on the locality. 
So I'm not aware of any Ghana Education Service School, GS school, saying that they are not going to teach a certain language. I'm not personally aware. I'm drawing, I'm, coming, I'm bringing to your attention as a member of parliament in Accra, the fact that slowly a lot of public schools, we are being inundated with complaints and petitions that public schools in Accra, or Greater Accra region for that matter, are not teaching the children in the Ghan language because they, they don't have, they say they don't have Ghan teachers. So, what assurances are you giving the people in the region that when you are approved, you will take an action to make sure that teachers are trained not only in Ghan language but across the country in their various languages so that they could be posted to those regions in order to enhance our children's cultural values by learning their local mother tongues? Mr. Chairman, I take this as a very important advice from my colleague and it's something I'm going to seriously look into. So my second question is on private tertiary institutions. I guess you know, you are aware that private tertiary institutions that are not chartered have to pay what they call affiliation fee to the universities, public universities that mentor them. And, for example, UCC, they used to pay almost in dollars, but now they're paying 135. In UCC, uh, private schools that are, that are affiliated to UCC are now paying 135 cities per student on the fees. Gimpa is even worse. Gimpa, they are paying an application fee of $4,000. The program evaluation fee of $2,400, Affili affiliation approval fee of $8,000, that is a one-time payment, and then annual subscription fee of $4,000, and then annual program administration fee of $140 per student per year. And this is seriously crippling the private university institutions. What measures, when approved, are you going to put in place in order to ensure that these private institutions that are also offering service to us in the education industry would, the, the applications for, to be chartered will be expedited so that they will stop paying these huge and drastic fees to other institutions? And what measures are you going to put in place to reduce these fees that are being charged because they look very exorbitant. Honorable Chair, I'm happy to inform uh, the committee that the Ghana Tertiary Education Commission law that was passed by this House uh, has abolished affiliation for all new tertiary institutions. Those existing private institutions have been given four to five years to uh, go through the process of being chartered. And when, by your help and the House, I'm approved, I am going to do whatever it takes to ensure that we implement uh, what we have passed as part of the Ghana Tertiary Education Commission uh, Law Act. At Honorable Minister, um, are you aware that a public institution is charging in dollars. Are you aware of that? Honorable Chair, I'm aware of the fees being charged, but as to how it is denominated, I'm not aware, sir. Very well. Kindly take note. If they are charging in dollars, they are breaching the laws of Ghana. Um, let me also ask, Honorable uh, Minister, can you tell me what level and how many private institutions benefited under the COVID relief because they are one of the school and one of the people who have really suffered as a result of the COVID, the closure of schools, they have to pay salaries, they have to pay. And also, when we reopen schools, 
whilst the public institutions are just getting more students and even like Legon deciding to do shift system. The private institutions are virtually empty. How can we rearrange the process in such a way that the university students will admit and then those who don't get the opportunity of entering a, the public universities can easily and under conditions of affordability have access to private institutions in order to help us bring out more graduates. I'm not, which, uh, I'm not aware of the extent of support for public tertiary institutions under the COVID relief. Uh, in terms of the private universities, I believe that when I get the opportunity, I'll look into meet with them and see the extent to which we can support them. But I'm not, um, at this point, I don't have the information on the extent of the relief that was given to public tertiary universities. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, okay, yeah. Who's the chairman? Honorable nominee, congratulations. Um, in your introduction, you've talked about your experience in the United States. To what extent did your previous job as professional educationist in the USA impact your work as deputy minister? And how has it shaped you to now lead the Ministry of Education? Thank you, Honorable Chair. I will say that what I got from the education system uh, in the U.S. was the fact that uh, when outcomes are the issue at stake, everything is put on the table. Everything in the sense that all strategies will be employed to ensure that the outcome that the system so desire is accomplished when it's about uh, looking at the access, looking at quality and the relevance of the education system, uh, people are held accountable to ensure that the quality outcome that are so desired is accomplished. But I'll tell you this, if there's anything that I can say I gained from uh, America, it will be the can-do attitude, everything is possible. So any challenge that I confront in the education system, my mindset is that Everything is possible if we all come together and put our minds to it, we can get it accomplished. Thank you. Um, some people are of the view that early education opportunities in our schools must teach our kids how to code. They must learn artificial intelligence. And letters I have gotten from colleagues and teachers is that for so many years now, you have not upgraded teachers. Has it come to your attention? And working at the ministry as a deputy minister, what did you do to improve the situation? And how do you intend to even make it better if you get the approval of this house? Honorable Chair, I know that from time to time, teachers will WhatsApp me, some will come to my office. Uh, but I also know Ghana Education Service are doing a very much better job at this time in terms of issues about promotion, even the new promotion exam format, uh, which has been implemented very well by them, and they are, it's winning our colleagues in terms of how they're able to go through it fast without all the subject panels and, and interviews. But we can always improve on these issues, and I'm sure most of these items that you brought up here is also going to be dealt with under the comprehensive teacher policy. And once we have a policy, they'll be able to track performance very well. I will tell you one thing. Um, teachers uh, play a critical role, the most important role in our education process. And anything that we need to do to ensure that the bottlenecks that may be in their way are removed so that they can focus on teaching is something that I'll commit myself 100% to. You appear to me as somebody who knows a lot about these issues. And, uh, please understand, God willing, if I'm the Minister for Education, I'll be calling upon you a lot. Uh, because if we can remove those bottlenecks, then we are freeing the teachers to really teach and impact our children positively. So these are issues that are of concern to me. If a teacher is not satisfied with the process, 
that means is diminishing his ability to become the best teacher that we want him to be, and the nation will pay a price for it. So I uh, thank you for bringing, bringing these issues to my attention, Mr. Chairman. Now my second substantive question. Um, Child Rights International has come up with uh, Pete suggesting that in the last four months, over or about 1,700 students have tested positive for COVID-19. Some medical experts, like the GMA president in Ashanti region, have called for or have suggested that schools be closed down. Reading commentary on social media, parliament and parliamentarians were not spared when the speaker announced the suspension of parliament and Many parents wondered why we thought it necessary to suspend parliament that allows schools to continue. What is your understanding of the spread as reported by Child Rights International in the schools and government's insistence that the schools must remain open? Honorable Chairman, I have the privilege of answering this question before, so I will answer again. I think what I said uh, when this question was posed to me a few minutes ago uh, was that to the extent that we can ensure that the schools are clean and PPEs are supplied and we are following all the protocols, to the extent that the schools can be a safer environment than the home or the community, then I will say schools should remain open. That is why uh, the following of the protocols, ensuring that students are going through routines, teachers are being trained so that the protocols become second nature uh, to the students, ensuring that there's a lesson unit that is taught about disease spread and especially with reference to COVID-19. These are critical issues and also ensuring that the new dashboard that we are developing for schools include opportunity for timely reporting of places where this uh, there's a suspected case, reports are being made. To the extent that we can do all these things and we are ahead of the disease in terms of decision making, I'll say the schools become the safest environment for the children to be. On the other hand, if we are not able to do that, then it makes sense to say, let's close down school. But at this point, I think Ghana Education Service, Ghana Health Service are in partnership and they are doing a very good job in terms of ensuring that we can get ahead of the virus and make the critical decisions that affect the children in the schools. And with that, I will not say schools should be closed down. Well, I wish I knew you were going to answer this question this way. Maybe I would have also arranged for a video to be played. It was just sent to me, but uh, maybe I can show it to you. So you see what the real situation is. You have painted the ideal picture, but the real situation on the ground is that even where some sort of semblance of PPEs are provided, children do not know how to use them. In the, in the face of the reality that even where semblance of PPEs are provided, they are either misused or disregarded, you still think that uh, GES is doing a good job and schools must uh, remain open. In the face of the reality that you have rightly painted and pointed out, it creates a sense of urgency for me to make sure the right thing is done to keep our children safe. And in the face of that, it gets me angry that why is it that we are not doing the right thing when we know the right thing to be done? So you create a sense of urgency for me to go about my work with all due diligence to make sure that children are protected. And that includes my team at Ghana Education Service and my team, not at the headquarters region, at the district, everywhere where we find our team members, everybody should be fully conversant of the fact that we cannot do our work that way. So when you, say, you show that to me, it does not tell me that we should close shop. It tells me that I should step into this job knowing that there's a lot to be done and we need to protect 
our children understanding that COVID-19 and education has become strange bedfellows. And those of us in charge of education must do our work well to ensure that we protect the children and at the same time ensure that they have quality education. Now, what expectations should students have of you if you get the nod to become the Minister of Education when only some few weeks ago, a proposal to have their fees suspended. So you Honorable rather... Member, you came in late. No, no, it's All in a different form. questions have been asked. In a different form. It's, it's, it may be related to the matter, but the question is different, Mr. Chairman, with, well, all, with all due speaking. respect. Yes. So I'm saying that what expectation do you think students should have of you when a few weeks ago a motion in this house that requested government to suspend or waive fees of uh, senior, I mean, uh, 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 tertiary students. Your argument seemed to be to have favored school authorities and not the students because you made the point that school authorities you spoke to said that was not their priority. But I believe at the time that was a priority of students. And if that was lost on you, what expectation should they have of you? Uh, students should know that I'm the teacher in chief when I become the minister for education. Some of them will see me in their classrooms. But besides that, the person that you are talking about happens to be somebody who a month ago paid the fees of 30 students to go and pursue engineering at UMAT. So if you're talking about expectation of me, they should expect to see a minister of education who dearly cares about them, whose doors will always be open to them. And uh, if you like it, I'll say the windows will be open to them. I want to dialogue with stakeholders, ensure that their views will be respected. So the expectation that this country should have of me is that of an education minister who is fully committed to meet their needs and who, when the need arises, may even pick up the marker and teach in the classroom. Because I see myself not as a, just a minister for education, I see myself as a teacher in chief of this country if I get a chance to become the minister for education. And my last question relates to uh, licensure exams and posting of newly trained teachers to do national service. Is it the case that the licensure exams have indeed been suspended or, you know, withdrawn from government plans as announced by the, the then Minister of Education before the elections? And after one year of national service by teacher trainees who initially protested against it, what has been the feedback? as Deputy Minister, as you were then, as you then was. Uh, Honorable Chair, the Minister, going Minister for Education, never announced the suspension of Lansing exams in this country. I never heard it, and um, he never said that Lansing exams have been suspended in this country. He never did? Okay. Well, you'll be appearing before us, so fine. Thank you. Very well. Any more from here? None. Yes, Honorable. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, congratulations to my brother, the Honorable Dr. Yahose Duchum. If you come with me less than a minute, we can get this out of the way for the accuracy of our records. Page two of your CV, uh, the Duration of your employment, Deputy Minister, it should be 2017 to 2021, not 2020. And we would need your permission to effect that uh, correction at page five, all the entries. It should be up to 2021, not 2020. And uh, page six, you will agree with me that the President of Ghana Association of Southern California, 1996 to 2000, is not a professional body. So we'll put that under a different uh, uh, categorization. 
So we are done with that. Let me quickly move to my first substantive question, which will focus attention on academic freedom. Over the last four years, it appears, listening to many in the intelligentsia, the academic community, they say that there seem to have been an assault waged on academic freedom and institutional autonomy. What is your position on the public university bill? Are we to see you pursue that unpopular, rather obnoxious bill? Are you going to pursue it? Public university bill. I'm our chair. Um, the public university bill which the universities and the going minister have had some dialogue on. Changes were made in various sections, and we are still dialoguing. So when God willing, I become the minister for education with your help, I will continue the dialogue and bring finality to it so that we can all move on and ensure that the universities perform their rightful role. Um, in a um, socioeconomic transformation of this country. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A follow-up on academic freedom and institutional autonomy, a classic case of University of Education, Winneba. A lot has happened in that institution, which has dented its uh, image as far as uh, its world-class academic center of higher education is concerned. Are you aware that the latest effort to resolve, resolve the Ampas death, which was chaired by the respected venerable Sir Justice Dennis A.J., Justice of the Court of Appeal and the Dean of the School of Gimpa, on that committee was also Professor Jofus Anamwa Mensa former Vice Chancellor of the University of Education, Winima. you know he chaired the last education reforms, and Dr. Abna Asumeni, they concluded that the removal of Professor Avoke was wrongful. Those are the words of the committees. I have a copy of a 42-page report which they issued, that it was wrongful. It did not follow the Constitution, and it did not follow the statutes of the university. Confirming what uh, former President Rawlings as you recall, God bless his soul, he issued a statement calling it an injustice, the removal of Professor Avoke, replacing him with Professor Afubroni. You are aware the Yoko report has also uh, cleared Professor Avoke. How do you intend to address these injustices at the University of Education, Winneba? As all of these reports have com confirmed, the latest one being the Sir Justice Dennis A.J. report, and I'm glad that the Honorable Deputy Majority Leader is here, who is very conversant with these matters. Honorable Chair, I have heard my colleague loud and clear in terms of the issues raised. I'm not a lawyer, but I can read legal reports. So God willing, when I take over, these are, are issues that I will delve into, become more conversant, with the issues, and I think that is what will help me know how to proceed. And at this point, I did not carry the tertiary schedules or schedule like you were lucky enough to, uh, to have um, done when you were at the ministry. I was playing with the children, but now as a minister, I have to play with the big boys, and I have to be able to dive into this and see what is going on. And I'll be able, with advice, from the outgoing minister and others who are conversant with the issues, I'll be able to know what to do with the issues that you have raised at this uh, appointment committee hearing. The second substantive matter I want to move to relates to the latest World Bank Human Capital Index report. It makes for grim reading and worrying reading indeed ghana was last but one in the rankings in the world 
the reporters, you know, measured quality of learning in schools. And according to the report, we were amongst the five worst performing countries in the world with a score of 307. Uh, only Niger helped us to escape the last position. Uh, Mali, Sierra Leone, Democratic Republic of Congo, and, uh, and, and, Niger, and, and Niger are the five last performing countries, or worst performing countries, with a score of 44%. This Human Capital Index report reveals that quality at the pre-tertiary level, which is a department you headed, has taken a hit. And that if we are to get to the levels of countries like Singapore, which is having a score of 88, we will have to adopt a paradigm shift and change strategy. Are you aware of this report? And what will you do to reverse this horrendous performance by Ghana. Honorable Chair, I'm fully aware of this report. I've gone over it many times. And I'll tell you one thing. As a nation, we have to come to the point where we see the relationship between education and socioeconomic transformation and where the report like this places us. When you talk about a human capital index of 0.44, it means 50%, 56% of your human capital is being wasted if you do nothing. So when you talk about the low performing school, 10,000 of them are with Gallup bringing in funding so that we can fix those schools. Those are attempt to fix the 0.44 uh, human capital index issue. But we need to do more. You know about the SIP secondary education improvement project that uh, my honorable colleague and uh, your uh, minister did a very good job at. Uh, that has helped us with all the intervention our minister also did to produce a mathematical score of about 65%. So it, what it tells us is this. If we are focused and we are determined, change will happen. So as the change happens with ad, uh, additional financing for SIP, with the initial financing from you and the work we did, and we saw the improvement in the same vein. Gallup, if we focus our efforts in ensuring that we can improve work that is going on in those 10,000 low performing schools, we'll be able to move things up. But yes, I come into this position with a greater sense of urgency, understanding that even in the midst of COVID, the world is not waiting for us. We have to do whatever it takes to make sure you create a more vibrant and robust education system that will stand the test of time. And our normal colleague, you know I'll be leaning on you from time to time to uh, work together to ensure that we can transform our education uh, system for the benefit of ourselves and for prosperity. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to come to the handing over notes of the ministry. I have okay, gone through this is your the third four question. So four this is my third. <laughs> so please do your call and fifth, and then I'll, I'll let you go. I'm grateful, Mr. Chairman. So the 391 page handing over notes, I have read them. To my surprise, it appears you have changed the format this time. There are no outstanding obligations, financial obligations. Why is the report silent on that? Because I know, for example, that uh, there are matters to do with 840 pickups, for example, that you, have not done, you are not done paying for, 250 buses. The 20 STEM centers have not been paid for fully. All of these outstanding obligations, you are handing over notes, are silent on them. Honorable Chair, it happens to be the handover news that I'm going to be receiving. <laughs> so I'll put a question to the right person when I'm getting the handover notes. It's not, it's not my... I, don't, I, I didn't hear you if you can. Did, are you saying, you're saying you haven't seen the handover notes? 
Honorable Osler, can you allow the nominee to... I want to hear him rather, not you. It's not your turn, please. Honorable, he says that when we approve him, he will receive it. Now he hasn't received it. No, you receive it during the transition. But Parliament has received it, and the well, in finally, in this handy leader, you, you want to okay. Finally, in this handing over note, it is revealed that 11 percent of uh, of free SHS students don't take up the, the opportunity. 11 percent just stay home, which is which is quite a staggering number, and should avert our minds to probably other factors that beyond just fees, there are other real considerations that we should be looking at. And that looks like our fixation on just fees, fees, fees. It's not only a matter of affordability, that there are other factors that are mitigating against 100% uh, universal uh, enrollment. Uh, are you aware of, of this uh, development and what policy initiatives, if given the nod, will you pursue to address this gap? Honorable Chairman, I'm fully aware of the 11 person issue. I think there's a need for a more serious community effort in making sure that the things that some of us may take for granted, that some children may not have, they can be supported. For example, uh, we'll take it for granted. Oh, you can just buy a trunk. You can just get a chop box. For some families, that is a huge investment. So I think what this helps us to do is to begin to look at what we need to do to ensure that those who are coming from some very deprived communities have some kind of support so that when you offer them the opportunity, they will grab it and run with it. Thank you. Yes, um, not yeah. uh, well, well, yes, uh, don't do that. Honorable nominee, um, it's going to be that tertiary more. education. More. Um, no, today they, 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 in the wake of this COVID, there has been a strong suggestion for government to make some interventions. Uh, we are aware of the scholarship secretariat uh, window that has been opened. We are also aware of the, the student loan scheme window with this no guarantor uh, policy. But what Ghanaians do not know is whether or not the fee structure as it is now, government is already absorbing some aspect of it. So kindly enlighten us on that. Is it that whatever fee charged, itemized, various uh, uh, facility user fee is 100% uh, to pay by student or that government has already absorbed a chunk of it leaving that to be paid by the student. And I would say um, the issue of fees, if you really look at the amount of the budget that goes into uh, the expenditure structure of the universities, about 90% will be expenses are related to faculty remuneration. Consequently, when you talk about academic user fee, you are not talking about fees that are going to be used in paying professors compared to the private university setting. So yes, you can say that the government is already paying 90% of the fees that the student will have paid, because about 90% of the expenditure of universities are that for faculty and for staff and 
In education, that is the norm. If you go to secondary education level, uh, if you look at the budget structure, you're going to see 75% to 85% is for uh, the personnel who are there. So when you pay academic user facility fee, you are not paying that to pay professors. So when you look at the fee structure, it is not geared towards payment of fees as you would in a private university setting. So yes, the government is paying a huge amount of money to take care of students for the benefit of the country. And whatever you pay in terms of academic user facility fee, it's just to take care of a small proportion of the total expenditure uh, of the government. Um, now, let's also come to this issue of fee paying. Fee paying. Um, a student from a deprived school makes a grade. And by way of some standards, the, he would not get the opportunity into mainstream. Yet to be given an option to be part of school a fee pay. That student from a deprived community is most likely to have a poor parent. In view of that, would not cannot take advantage of that school pay fee pay. Yet somebody whose parent can afford would get the opportunity to do that fee pay. Now, in addressing such imbalances, how do you hope to push the universities to do ensure equity without they seeing you as interfering in their independence? Honorable Chair, I want to thank my honorable colleague for the question. That be careful so that they don't think you're interfering. But I think what is fair is fair. What is injustice is injustice. And what we need to do is be able to dialogue more uh, to ensure that if you have a student like that, most universities have a need of base scholarships. So they can do well to target those students who come from deprived communities or disadvantaged backgrounds, got an admission to pursue medicine, and cannot go uh, because it has been classified as fee paying. I think what we need to do is to make sure that whether we have scholarship programs targeting them or out of the university's own need-based scholarships, such students uh, will be supported and not be turned away from uh, programs of their dreams. Yes. So, Honorable Dominique, um, let's come to private education, the, those preparatory schools that we have. They don't teach Ghanaian language. GIS, SOS, Lincoln, name them. They don't teach Ghanaian language. You have resident diplomats who may come on a duty tour five years, four years. They are children being educated here. And we want some adaptation, some cultural assimilation. Even Ghanaian children in these schools. I had my colleague Neil Ante even raising the question even with public schools where Ga teachers, you know, is becoming a problem. But you and I know that we cannot allow that freedom in those preparatory schools. Can you initiate a dialogue aimed at, uh, I don't want to say giving them the option, a dialogue aimed at, uh, you know, getting them to appreciate the fact that learning our culture, our values, which include our language, is very necessary for their curriculum. Honorable Chair, uh, my colleague is encouraging me to begin a dialogue, and I will so do. 
because I think it's to the benefit of the children. When the children are able to speak an African language, wherever they go in the future, they are going to turn back and say, thank you for giving me that opportunity. So I think it's something that I'm going to pursue vigorously because it's not something that will help the student. It will make them better citizens for this uh, global community. Thank you. I beg you, Honorable Leader, please conclude. John, I was making an application for the Honorable Agaga, but I'll be mindful that I won't take enough time of our colleagues. He has just one one. Once we're across to the leadership, please, I'll go back. All right, that's noted. Minister, welcome. I note that when they shared euphemism with you on the shoes of the Honorable Napo and what he has achieved, you readily measured your shoe size to be equal without appreciating the euphemism of it. And then when the Honorable Black War was on, they were, you were being helped when he got to handing over notes. Uh, I refer you to page two of your handing over notes, page two. And how I expected you to have said the same thing in respect of handing over notes. Hear these words, your own words, supported the ministry in the implementation of free senior high school. Not even support the president, supported the minister in the implementation of double track system not the present. So, I, okay, CV. This is your CV. So how I wish you had also said that you supported the minister to write the handing over notes in that part of your CV. It's just an observation. <laughs> it's just an observation. But uh, there's some fumigation work going on at the ministry. At what cost is it? What faces? What is the relationship? Fumigation. There's some fumigation work ongoing at the ministry, particularly in public uh, schools, was the nature of it and was the cost of it to the state. Honorable Chair, I will uh, gather the information for this committee. I, I don't have it with me here. When you have it, do share it with us through the chairman of the committee. I can understand you have been elevated and promoted by President Akufuado from Deputy Minister to Minister. We don't intend to hold you for the work of your Minister, the Honorable uh, Napo. But there's this report of uh, Messrs. Bluegrass, Supply of Mathematic Instrument, SMI, Math Set has all arrived in the country, the masses that were so imported, for which you came to Parliament for some grant of tax exemptions <clears throat> pre-COVID. Have they all arrived? And have they all been distributed? And to where? Which institutions? Honorable Chair, I will submit a detailed report on that to the committee as well. All right, that's appreciated. Now, on your CV, the Honorable Black One has uh, done that. And uh, there are wide disparities in the provision of quality relevant education between public and private schools and rural urban schools. What will you do to address that? to ensure equity in the provision of relevant quality education at the various levels of education. Honorable Chair, issues of equity is something that uh, the ministry is confronting and something that we need to deal with. Uh, yes, uh, disparity between rural children and urban children. Uh, one major disparity, disparity between the north and south of this country uh, these are issues that are of importance to me, and God willing, and with the help of the committee, this is something that I'm going to pursue vigorously, uh, because when it comes to uh, disparity, if you don't solve it, you are not creating a more robust education system uh, for the country. Uh, so even uh, the way uh, you get our students into various high schools, from junior high school, you have to be mindful of disparities and also ensuring that there are quality schools everywhere in the country, you are able to solve some of the uh, disparities uh, in that fashion. 
So uh, honorable chair, this is something that equity issues are something that we need to look at, taking a look at some of them because I was fortunate enough to be at the ministry for four years. And as I said, uh, these are issues that we need to take a look at. I was looking at my data and saw the drop in performance at Wa Senior High School, and it's something that I'm going to take on board as to why there is that disparity and why performance at that school is dropping across the board in all the subject areas. Uh, these are things that uh, concerns me. I love data. So I'm going to look at data and see how best we can solve uh, these challenges. The Honorable Abraco referred you to the public universities bill was important and even by virtue of Article 103 and in particular 106 of the Constitution. I need your assurance that you would not interfere as minister with the letter and spirit of the Constitution and guaranteeing academic freedom in Ghana. Honorable Chair, uh, my star is not interference and my star is collaboration. My star is communication. My star is come and let's work together to make sure we can reap dividends for this country. And that is what I intend to do. Uh, and and, and that as house. important as a public universities bill, we would be assured that whatever decisions you would be taking will require and submitted recorded report of extensive stakeholder consultation to guide any policy decision of government. Can I have that assurance? Honorable Chair, uh, there has been stakeholder consultation. I intend to continue, and I intend to make sure we we'll come to finality on this issue. And teachers, I, I can assure you. teachers who have gone on steady leave to improve themselves as in their quality and to improve the work they do since 2019 have not been promoted. Is that the case? And what will you do to promote those teachers deserving of their promotion after their steady leave. Honorable Chair, I'm not aware that for two years teachers have not been promoted. I know Ghana Education Service is working very hard on these issues, but it's an issue that is of concern to me. A teacher who has not been paid his due is not a teacher who will give up his best. And therefore, uh, there's an issue that I'm taking notes, and I'll make sure I get to the bottom of it when I get to the ministry. Ghana Education Service will have to give me a report, and I'm going to track that on a on bi-weekly basis to make sure everything, any one due promotion has been promoted, uh, so that they will work hard for us. So it's something that I intend uh, to follow through on in terms of my promise to uh, my honorable colleague. The president at the final funeral rise to bid farewell to Jerry John Rollis with his dedicated excellent service to Ghana even though said Jerry Rollins himself late had said that he wanted to be remembered in the hearts, hearts of people, the president announced that he still was consulting with the family to name the University of Development Studies after Jerry John Rollins. You recall that he took his FAO prize and dedicated it to that university, which has contributed immensely to expanding access to higher education. You have a time limit to which you bring a bill here for that to be done if satisfactory consultations are done with the family and it's acceptable to them. On our right, you said the president made a statement. I'll be consulting with the president on it uh, to make sure what the president intends to do uh, is fully executed as he so desires. Chairman, may I request a nominee, and it's not just a challenge for incoming Minister for Education if you are approved by this committee and plenary, but a challenge imposed by COVID for major public sector reforms in Ghana generally. And I should think that myself and you are advantaged because our children can benefit even from private quality education because we can afford it. A number of Ghanaian children, those for which you just announced reopening, who have been home for eight, nine months, did not have opportunity for Zoom learning or Zoom exchanges. Some of them couldn't even afford access to a television to be educated. Compelling reforms 
of the provision of quality public education, what leadership will you provide? Honorable Chair, issues about connectivity and how to support children is something that we need to have a better handle on. Um, as I pointed out recently, that when you have a digital divide in the community, you are more likely to have education divide. It's something that we need to confront in terms of making sure children have access, and, and having access means uh, now there are tablets and other devices that can enable them to connect uh, to uh, resources that sometimes may even be free. So yes, as uh, um, when God will have the minister, in these challenging times, those uh, issues, IT issues, are some uh, critical issues that should concern me and concern my team uh, to make sure we can really confront uh, this issue. The good news is that the Ministry of Communication is helping with rural connectivity. Uh, and, and I, I think it's something that we need to tap into and form a critical partnership uh, to make sure that children in communities where there was no access even to cell phones and, and other things, now that it's improving, how do we take advantage of it uh, and, and make sure that uh, students are benefited. The Telco's uh, partnership with them is very important. During the first week of the COVID, I know a number of telecom companies provide zero rating uh, so that students, when they go to a website, learning management portal, they don't have to pay uh, for connectivity. These are critical partnerships that we need to establish. Thank Minister, you. my other one would be one of a comment. I think that you have to revolutionize, probably in collaboration with the Ministry of Communication, how we expand the deployment of ICT technology to guide teaching and learning, not just for people, but only for teachers across the country as a necessary response to COVID. Thank you for your advice, Honorable President. And Chairman, I recall that under an African Development Bank facility, about 180 million US dollars, that saw the expansion of Ada, Debopa, and a number of technical vocational institutions. One of the footprint signatures of your minister, outgone, uh, the Honorable Napu, was the expansion of technical and vocational education. What he normally doesn't tell the Ghanaian people, that was also initiated by the NDC, except that he got the advantage of those vocational institutions now being supervised by the Ministry of Education. Uh, I had visited the Honorable Minister-designate for Works and Housing, the one from Yangfu, uh, I'll get a name for uh, uh, our purposes, the Honorable Nominee for Works and Housing. Yes, I had visited Pre Frida Prempe's vocational training institution, and when I got back, I was inspired by it and wrote subsequently to Minister of Finance. I'm aware that your minister have initiated it. It will require expansion, but it also requires collaboration. You see, what is lacking in this country is employability skills. So it is not just about training, about classroom. Are we equipping the young people with employable skills? That, I believe, is a policy trust of the expanded access to technical and vocational education. Will you continue and expand that initiative? On our chair, I intend to do so. I'll continue and expand that policy. Uh, now you are tired, so you two you are giving short answers. <laughs> Chairman, have you observed? Okay, my final one, Chairman, is a constituency specific matter. And I'm borrowing from the minister. So that one is just to take note. You can choose to ignore me. In your CV, you say you lobby for projects and programs to serve your constituents. You want that to be in your CV? Go to page two of your CV. Page two. And if I have my way, ask German and expunge it from the record. Hi, oh, of the that is, this is the code. Yes. Core, eh? Mm, and, is as, uh, and is that a court duty? Yeah, After enacting laws, 
Not be for fruit yet. Well. Uh, okay, that reminds me. So, I'm not going to lobby you. There's a community in the Tamale South constituency, Kakwaile, Kakwaile, Kakwaile. I need a senior high school of respect <laughs> in Kakwaile in the Tamale South constituency. This is not lobby, this is instruction. No, it's not instruction. <laughs> I want expanded access to senior high school. And no, no, no. Oh. I say I won't use his words. <laughs> I don't intend to use his words. Uh, uh, honorable Chair, I know one good thing about senior high schools in Ghana is that irrespective of where it is located, it's for the whole country. So if a senior high school is built in my honorable colleague's uh, constituency, it's also for my children from my constituency. I'm not saying it for the first time. Your minister is aware. My letter has been at the ministry <laughs> all these years. So uh, it's not, I'm not saying it for the first time. Because you didn't lobby. Yes, I should think so. <laughs> okay, well, I, Honorable Chair, I, I can assure you that as I've, <laughs> as I've already indicated, even though... Chairman, let me put it in context. There was a contract awarded for the commencement of work on Kapaile Senior High School. The contractor mobilized the site and the change of government have affected the fortunes of quality education in Kapaili, which will serve Banvum, Yonda, Kamiele, Bulipiala, and Nalung, quite a populous area in my constituency. We, 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 those who don't sleep in Kampili, they know themselves. So I, 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 I want to end here by saying that your enormous challenge is to how to support this country to respond to COVID. And to respond to COVID, what the Honorable Suhino observed, protecting children, ensuring their safety and security, dedicated and adequate deployment of PPS to protect people and teachers in schools, and to reform education as a response to COVID and to guarantee that there can be seamless provision of education in Ghana if COVID was to stay. Chairman, I thank you for the opportunity and I wish the nominee well. Thank you. Um, Honorable Minister, I'm just making a suggestion. I think the integrity gap is widening among the youth in, in the community. So I suggest oh. to you that you find a way of institutionalizing but, 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 ethics oh, no. and no, values of integrity in our educational system. That's a suggestion. So we thank you for attending upon the committee. Uh, we have closed this. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm happy you came after. <laughs> Honorable Chair, thank you for the opportunity to yeah. join the committee members. Right. Truly really appreciate it. Uh, you will hear from us, but for now you are discharged.
in the next decade. What is your response to such views? And should we expect changes to our educational structure to this effect? Honorable Chair, the early grade infusion of computing, coding, and other aspects of STEM-related issues have already begun in our education system under the leadership of the outgoing Minister, Honorable Matthew Poku Prempe. Various initiatives uh, were undertaken, some became policy, uh, some were incorporated into the curricula. STEM schools and centers under construction throughout the country. Various coding programs have been introduced. And with understanding that we are in the fourth industrial revolution, and in the fourth industrial revolution, countries that are going to be competitive will be the ones uh, that will be able to equip their citizens with the right skills in STEM fields. And therefore, everything that needs to be done in terms of peripheral change has been initiated. When God willing, I become the Minister for Education, I am going to continue this effort. I will get a rare opportunity of operationalizing nine science schools that are under construction currently across the length and breadth of this country. I will have the wonderful opportunity of operationalizing 20 STEM centers also under construction across the country. And I'll be able to have the opportunity to ensure that schools are uh, encouraged and supported uh, so that they can infuse uh, IT-related activities into our programs. Honorable Chair, today is a Women and Girls Science Day as declared by UNESCO. And I want to take this opportunity to um, recognize Manfred Methodist Girls Senior High School for the great achievement that they are demonstrating in the field of STEM, especially in the field of robotics. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, there has been several attempts to bridge the gap that exists between courses that are taught in our schools and schools that are needed in the job places. To the extent that some graduates complete universities or tertiary institutions and sit home for four years, five years without a job. Some people are of the opinion that the education curriculum should be such that no student in Ghana should complete whether grammar or high school without a particular set of technical skill. How are you going to um, address this particular situation? Mr. Chairman, in education, uh, we deal with access, we deal with quality, and we deal with relevance. And invariably, one area that has uh, given a number of developing countries a lot of challenges is in the area of relevance. Uh, if you look at what we, do, we are doing in Ghana in the field of engineering, a field that is in, um, is in great demand, uh, we have currently about 36,000 um, 36, students enrolled in engineering. So give and take, we have about 9,000 that graduates annually. Our population is 31 million approximately. And if you compare that to a country like Vietnam with 90 million population, we are producing 9,000 engineers. They are producing 100,000 engineers a year. So go figure the reason why we have Samsung are building the largest manufacturing hub in Vietnam. So yes, the relevance is very important. But we have built some barriers in our education system. I always go to school, visit schools, and invariably, our headmasters will tell me that, oh, these are visual art students. Oh, visual art students, and by implication, they are not the smartest in the school. But I always say to myself, you are most creative. The child who can draw a bridge, draw you, you are telling me they are not the smartest. That means that giving a, really put a barrier. I always tell the story of Kojo Mensah who had a dream. And God was telling Kojo that, Kojo, you're going to be the world's best engineer. And then he said, God, you don't know me. I'm doing visual arts. Now, if your most creative person who can draw cannot be an engineer, 
then you know that you have built some barriers in front of your children. The most creative cannot be the ones who be innovative enough to build the best cars and the best bridges and all the kind of things for you. That is why you look at the a reform champion by the outgoing minister in the area of Common Core to make sure you can broaden the outlook and the, and the skill set that students are supposed to have and therefore improve on the soft skills of communication, of creativity, of critical thinking and collaboration. And once you are able to invite in, the, uh, in that in the, in the students and they have the soft skills, then it's easier for them to move from sociology to software engineering. Who are the best to develop our software for us and not the sociologists? But the barriers that we mostly erect is what is preventing us to make our education system relevant to the needs of this country. So it's something that... Uh, um, Gisela, are you ready? Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Nominee. Um, in, um, I'm going to ask you some questions about kindergartens. In paragraph 570 of the 2017 budget statement and economic policy of the government, the construction of 1,171 kg blocks was promised were promised. Again, in paragraph 821 of the 2019 budget statement, it was reported that 90 had been completed in 2018, promising another 150 in 2019. When this was stated in 2017, what was the rate, what was the expected rate of uh, outflow of the kindergarten blocks? And the figures of 90, 150, and vis-a-vis -vis 1,171, what exactly were you trying to achieve over four years? Honorable Chair, if I heard it right, it's about the cages that we promised to go away. Is that? Yes, 1,171. OK. Yeah, I, at this time, I know from the data that was I got from my construction uh, division that 103 has been completed. Uh, 113 at, is at various stages of completion, and that is what I can tell you at this time. So, in other words, it's not even about 20 uh, percent? Yeah, it's approximately. About 20 percent have been 20%. completed. All right. I say this because for those of us who have semi urban and rural communities, we have a lot of communities where children have to walk five kilometers, little children of age two and three or four, they have to watch, walk those long distances to school, to a KG, just to have a KG education. So the need to have kindergartens, is, it goes without saying. This is the 21st century, but we still have these challenges of the children, like I say, having to walk long distances. Eventually, they're going to take the same exams in, as the urban areas, Accra, Kumasi, and so on and so forth, even the 1,171, if you ask me personally, was woefully inadequate. I'm sorry, I don't think you are the chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, in other words, the, your rollout is very low and very slow. What are you going to be able to do to ex expedite it and make sure that those kind of communities, like in my constituency, and I'm sure yours, you have the same problem as well, you're going to have to be able to have roll out a larger number of kindergartens. Because really, if you don't build the base, the base and the foundation right, you can, put, you can add on all the other layers, but then you know you're going to have a problem at the point where they take exams together. Honorable Chair, I take this as an advice, and a very important advice from my honorable colleague and I'll be consulting you. Thank you. Thank you. The second issue has to do with 
The Ministry of Education recently distributed about 250 buses and 90 pickup vans to educated, education related institutions. Can you tell the committee the cost of these vehicles and how the distribution was done? I am saying this because in my constituency I have an e block which was completed in 2016. They have been pleading for a bus in Bajrasi. They have been pleading for a bus. And for one or two reasons, best known to the political authorities, they cannot even get a bus for the school. What is the policy on distribution of buses? Do some have two? Do some have three? Do some have none at all? How is that done? For there, for there to be an equitable, equitable distribution of logistics to these schools. Honorable Chair, I'm surprised that a school that was operationalized in 2016 does not have a bus. My understanding, and from what I know at the ministry, all the e block schools that were open in 2016 were given buses. Uh, so, this is something that I'm going to take notice of and uh, make sure that um, when the next set of buses come, that school will be taken care of. Because my understanding was that every e block that was open that time got a Mahindra and a bus uh, at the same time, at that time, when the schools were being operationalized. Uh, so, I'll take uh, note of that. But I know that uh, schools that were given buses in 2016 were not eligible for the, this, uh, a bus this time around. So when the staff were working on it, I think that was the most important indicator of who gets the buses. But the first set of buses was also sent to the north um, as a way of making sure because the majority of the schools were with that buses there. So that was uh, where the first set of buses went. So at any point in time, uh, the division or the distribution is based on need. And whenever uh, we understand that if a school that doesn't have a bus, they're on a list. And when the buses come, we look at those who have never had a bus for a long time, never had a bus before, and they are prioritized. So I'll take this into advisement, please. Sorry. You didn't include the part about asking about what were the cost of the buses? Can you speak to your mic, Honorable Mayor? Oh, uh, right. Honorable Chair, I said I will provide that information, but I don't have it with me right now. All right, my last question. Mr. Chairman, let us be very frank about some discussions on the education. When governments change, you see, educational projects are executed by contractors who invest money into their businesses and they are awarded and they are supposed to execute the project. When two elephants are fighting, it is the grass that suffers. Eventually, you see a situation whereby a lot of the schools' infrastructure is either slow, on hold, or is incomplete. What happens? Enter free SHS with an influx of students who just need accommodation. And I give my village school, Ostek, as an example, which is 30 years old, but without proper dormitories even for the students, where they are converting classrooms to dormitories. This is the 21st century, and some of these things, I believe, should not be allowed. Either the Ministry of Education does not do the audits right to know what is really needed where, or something is amiss. So can you kindly assure, can you kindly give the assurance to this committee? Because parents send their children to school. They do not go and, ex they don't know, they don't go to expect congestion, a certain amount of congestion in the dormitories. There are many times when washrooms are outside, toilet con toilets and sanitary facilities are not up to scratch. What some of them even use in their homes is much better than what's even in the school. Now we send to these children to school to frame their... Honorable, apart from assurance, do you want something else? Mr. Chairman, thank you. I'll be guided. So the question is, what are you going to do as you get the nod, if you get the nod, to change this way of thinking, to prioritize where necessary the infrastructure that must go to a certain school, 
so that it is our children who are, excuse me to say, the grass that suffers when two elephants are fighting. Thank you. Honorable Chair, I know we have prioritized infrastructure needs assessment across the length and breadth of this country, but I know that if there were some in your school, you would not be complaining. Therefore, I'll be speaking with you, and I'll make sure that if there's something that has gone wrong in terms of the needs assessment and the infrastructure, infrastructure development that has been going on in other schools, I will seriously look into it. Thank you. Thank you. Just pay the contractors who you owe. That's all. That's all. Honorable Brandon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Congratulations, nominee. Mr. Chairman, as always, my preview will be five minutes. Kindly indulge me. See you've always done. Um, the nominee, Honorable. According to World Vision, COVID lockdown may keep one million girls out of school in Africa. Crutchy West, specifically, faced an almost ninefold increase in teenage pregnancy. Between March and May, there are 51 teenage pregnancies. At the same time, 2018, they had six. Now, this is in relation to STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. Now, 2020 marks the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action, the most comprehensive global agenda for girls and women to date. Doctor, are you a supporter of STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math? And if you are, kindly give me a preview of what you intend to do if you are giving the nod. Thank you. Honorable Chair, um, I would say that I'm a big supporter of science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and uh, that is why through my leadership and that of other agencies uh, with, uh, in my constituency developed uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics school. But as I indicated earlier, the government has also embarked on a major effort of developing STEM centers across the country. Uh, the president, a part of his um, uh, wish and, and, and determination to change and transform education, directed that 20 STEM centers be built. There are various stages. Uh, it will be equipped with robotics. Not only are the senior high school students going to be able to use, but the communities can also come in with little children to be able to participate in all the things that goes on in the, in the STEM center, in addition to the nine science schools that are under construction. So I want to assure you that I understand that across the world, the focus has been on STEM because STEM actually enables students to have certain important skills that is not readily available when we look at education system that focus on root memorization. You can't memorize when you are doing robotics. So it forces you to have certain kind of skills that is very unique, which then prepares you for the world of work. And then with those skills, we are able to move up into higher excellence of society, ready for college, ready for work. So uh, STEM is something uh, that is front and center of what we have been doing and what we are going to do um, when God willing, this committee uh, gives me the opportunity uh, and eventually, I'm sworn in as a Minister for Education. Thank you. So, nominee, uh, can you give briefly, maybe in a sentence or two, the need and reason behind the famous double track? That's the first one. Then the second one, a follow-up on that, so you can answer all in one part is we are churning out all these numbers at the SS level, and they clearly, if they pass, they're going to uh, create a huge number at the tertiary level. Are we ready to accommodate all these students when they pass at the, to the tertiary level? Double track one, and what happens if they get to the tertiary level? Thank you. Honorable Chair, uh, these issues about education is better understood when we put it within a certain context. A context that says that if you want your country transformed, you have to be mindful of your gross tertiary enrollment ratio. No country has transformed its fortunes in the 21st century 
without having a high level of gross tertiary enrollment ratio. So when we talk about uh, fees near high school, we talk about double track, when we talk about the fact that it's a leapfrogging strategy to get more children to be able to go to school, whilst you look at how best can I develop the infrastructure to make up for the infrastructure that I don't have. When you look at all those things, you situate it within the context of gross tertiary enrollment ratio and recognize that at this point in this country, we have 18% gross tertiary enrollment ratio, which is for the youth who are between the ages of 18 20 to 23, the only 100 that you meet on the street, 18 of them are in tertiary. In countries that have transformed their fortunes, you have to be 50% to 60% in order for you to really talk about long-term transformation of your country. So when you situate double track within the context of getting more students to go to the senior high school, you're also saying that if I don't get the majority of these young men and women to move up into tertiary space and also uh, get a high tertiary gross enrollment ratio, my transformation will forever elude me. So when we situate it within this context, then we look at the system and say, okay, we may not be satisfied with this at this time, but we know why we have to use this leapfrogging strategy. Recently, Brookings Institution came and, and they uh, did a study on the double track and said that it's one of the innovative, most innovative uh, systems that any African country has implemented. So, but if you don't situate it within the context and say, okay, do I leave 400,000 behind or do I bring them forward so that I can push them to tertiary? And when they get to tertiary, I want to see a tertiary that is reformed so that the courses that they are taking are relevant to the needs of the country. And if I could do all that in, in a synchronized fashion, I may be transforming my country. And then you begin to say that, okay, double track may inconvenience me as an individual, but for the benefit of the country, I'm willing to bear and make sure that the, the, the inconveniences that I'm having uh, will also be a sacrifice worthy of, um, of, of actually uh, 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 making so that my country can move forward. So, Chama, sir? Chama, Chama, if I have your indulgence, the nominee in an answer to what the Honorable Brian is drawing his attention to, use these words. I want to see a tertiary that is reformed. What he wants from you, you are to provide leadership in the tertiary reforms. What will you do? Arising out of the numbers that you anticipate will qualify out of free senior high school. So it's not to, for you to be tertiary reform. You are to lead it. Give us what you do to provide the leadership. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, uh, we have looked at infrastructure, done infrastructure needs assessment. God willing, when I become the minister, it's something that I'm going to be meeting with the universities over to see how we need it. We really uh, meet the needs in terms of infrastructure uh, so that the student will have the space. Thank you, sir. Yes. Um, Eric. I, I, Eric, before I go. Uh, Video of time, you are fine. Very well. I'll call Eric after that. After. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Nominee, Honorable Edichung. You recall that I brought a motion to Parliament to secure government support for tertiary education students. You nominee, nominee to the Ministry of Education publicly argued against the motion and voted against the motion. A lot of students have asked me to vote against your nomination. I am minded to. Can you convince tertiary education students across the country, you have the opportunity now, convince them that you care about 
assisting them to finance their education. In the light of the fact that in 2019, the allocation to Student Loan Trust was 37, 35 million, but the actual receipt was 18 million from the GET Fund. And the communication service tax was 850,661 Ghana cities, 44 pesos. In 2020, the allocation to Student Loan Trust was 35 million again. But then there was improvement in the actual receipts to 24.46 million and a communication service tax of 2 million, making the total 26 million. From the National Council for Tertiary Education, about 500 students were in tertiary education in 2020. You said that 70% were able to pay during the debate in Parliament. So assuming 30% are unable to pay, 30% of 500 will give us 150,000 students. If you divide your 24, 26 million by this 150,000 students who have not been able to pay, you get 176 Ghana cities per student. So assuming that you are making a student loan trust money available to, to them, each of them is going to get 176 Ghana cities. Only 176 Ghana cities. But the minimum university fees, that's the fees itself, not other expenses, boarding and lodging and other things. The minimum is 1,500 Ghana cities. That's the minimum. So convince me in the light of this that you have a magic wand, you have an idea how uh, university students or tertiary education students will be supported to be able to carry through the education. Honorable Chair, what I'll, <clears throat> I'll say is that I fully understand and appreciate the concern that you raised. I'll be the last person um, who will not support an effort to make sure that students with need are supported in order for them to secure tertiary education. Uh, when I, God willing, I become a minister, these are the issues I'm going to look into. We know, uh, I'll, I'll tell you, one way is removing the barrier of the guarantor system so that students who do not have people to guarantee for them will have access uh, to student loans. The reason why, invariably, uh, some students are not even accessing the loan is the fact that they don't have people to guarantee for them. Also, we need to streamline the very procedures uh, through which students secure loans. I personally feel strongly that it should begin at the time that you are applying to the universities. And that at the time that you are applying, you also apply, as a time in other jurisdictions, apply for the loan. So when your admission is, uh, is given to you, your loan is also ready uh, for the fees to be paid. So those are streamlining activities are very important to ensure that uh, the system where it tells you to go to the university before you apply, uh, that's not be, uh, no longer pertains. And once we streamline that, then the loan becomes of use to the very individuals who need it the most. Thank you, sir. Minister, do you understand the question? Because I'm saying that even if you removed the guarantor obstacle and you removed every other obstacle, the total loan portfolio available to the students by the records of what has been released in the past years is 26 million Ghana cities. That's the total loan portfolio available to them. 26 million Ghana cities. Honorable, uh, 26 million cities is from where? The Students' Loan Trust. 
That is what was released to them last year. So you're talking about last year? Yes. Okay. So okay. To make the fee as if it's being released this year? Yes. So, so, so that's the question. The question I'm asking is that if you took out, because the argument that is being made is as if the guarantor is the problem for students. But I'm saying that it is not the guarantor issue that is the problem. It is how much money is available. And the entire amount available last year was 26 million Ghana cities. And by your own argument about those who can afford and those who cannot afford, assuming that even 30% of the students cannot afford, a 30% by last year's total population of tertiary education students is 150,000. So if you divide 26 million Ghana cities by 150,000 50, students, the highest amount anybody will get in that group is 176 Ghana cities. So do you think that removing the guarantor is, 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 is the obstacle to getting support for education financing or increasing the pot of available money for student loans? And what commitments are you making in that regard since you say government shouldn't suspend the fees? Our chair, Student Loan Trust Fund has various sources of funding. One area that I'm not sure was factored into the amount that you are talking about is the, uh, the loans that people pay back. It's plowed back into their portfolio so that they can give that out to as loans back to the students. So you have to look at loans that are collected uh, from uh, the uh, outstanding loans. And, and that is more than the 26 million that my honorable colleague is talking about. So, so the amount that you get, the amount that you get from um, Get Fund is just one pot. The amount that they collect from the students, from the outstanding loans, is also another pot of money that they get for their activities. But I'm not saying that we should not make more much more money available to them, but the one source is not the only source. Next question. You haven't given the figures how much money is available to the students. I've given you a figure. You haven't given a figure. Uh, and that's the grievance the students have. Um, and somebody said personal. It's not personal. I'm not in special education, so I don't have a personal grudge with him. Um, the Get Fund 2018, you came to this house to ask for approval to securitize a portion of the GET Fund to raise 1.5 billion United States dollars, which in current value would be 8.7 billion Ghana cities. 1.5 billion dollars, 8.7 billion Ghana cities. I have a copy of the Minister of Education handed over notes. I believe you would have been involved in preparing the handover over notes. I have tried to peruse it to see where you have provided a list of the projects that, the infrastructure projects that you took the 8.7 billion cities to pay for or construct. Is there anywhere, is there any record where I can find data of the projects that you executed with the 8.7 billion Ghana cities that you securitize a portion of the debt fund to secure? Is there anywhere in the handover notes or any record that you have in the ministry of the projects that you did with the 8.7 billion Ghana cities that you, you took for educational infrastructure projects. I'm, I'm now going to I'll bring you a copy of the document that, um, that lists all the projects that have been executed. But I also would like to say that the entire amount has not been utilized. As I speak with you, 1.8 billion has been released and is best paid to contractors billion cities. And now that 800 million has been requested as a drawdown to further pay contractors. So as certificates become due, request is made 
and payment is effected. But I will bring to this committee the document that shows all the projects that have been um, that are under construction or has been completed as a result of the approval that we saw from Parliament. Chairman, just a, a follow up. Assuming you become Minister for Education, there is category of contractors known as get fund contractors, contractors within the sector who are executing various projects for government and the Ministry of Education. They have expectations. Some of them have been working. Their certificates have been at the ministry. They've borrowed from banks. They are suffering the interest regime on their borrowing. What assurance do you have for get fund contractors that they will get their money? Honorable Chair, God willing, if you give, uh, give me the opportunity and I become the minister, this is an area that I, I will immediately uh, follow up on uh, because I believe since we have funds, uh, we should not put contractors through a situation where uh, they are suffering interest payments. So I will seriously look into this and make sure um, any outstanding issues will be resolved. Uh, so that we treat them fairly as they also execute for us. Thank you, sir. Um, during the COVID period, government directed the closure of schools, public and private. So private schools closed, basic, secondary, tertiary schools closed. Government subsequently made various sums of money available to support the private sector. Did government, and you sat there as Deputy Minister of Education, and you ought to have advocated for schools, private schools, did you advocate for private schools to be given any support, given that there was a forced closure of the schools through no fault of theirs, and they did not run for close to a year, and lost income, and had to pay workers, were they a category of businesses that you thought that government funding should have gone to, to support, since we're supporting small and medium scale industries? Chair, I can say that our collaboration with MBSSI led to support being extended at some private schools. I will not be able to tell you uh, the percentage, but I know for a fact that some private schools got support through MBSSI. Are you minded to provide the list of the schools that were supported through MBSSI? Honorable Chair, MBSSI is not under the Ministry of Education and uh, to the extent that it's public record, I'll be able to ask them for it. But this, they are not our agency, and therefore, um, it's just, if it's public record and I go, whatever they give me, I'll bring to this committee. But it was not executed through the Ministry of Education. So how did you know that MBA, the schools were provided? Because you said that schools were provided. Thank you, Honorable Aiga. You have exhausted your full plus your follow-up. Yeah. Yeah. Patrick. Uh, no, Patrick. Yeah, the first I gave you, I didn't give Patrick. Now, Patrick. Congratulations, Doc. Congratulations. Um, first question. Research has shown that early childhood education positively impacts children's emotional and behavioral outcomes, including long-term reduction in criminal behavior. It's shown also to improve the health and safety of children. In Ghana, 98% of all childhood, early childhood centers are privately owned. Also, nurseries are not part of government's formal education system. So even the just 2% public nurseries are not under the capitation grant, by the information I have. 
this further poses a problem for teen mothers as they cannot go back to complete schools because they cannot afford private nurseries. What will you do to ensure that these nurseries are available to the poor? Thank you. On our chair, the early childhood education space um, that you refer to in terms of creatures and nurseries are uh, under the supervision of the Gender and Child Protection uh, Ministry. Uh, so uh, through the Social Welfare Department, they are in charge of it and not the Ministry of Education. But I think collaboration with them will be in order because that means they are creating the pipeline for us because the children are prepared very well at that level then they're going to do better when we get them at KG level. So I will pursue effective collaboration with the Gender and Child Protective um, Services Ministry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, a study also in rural Ghana revealed that school absenteeism among girls is about 63.4% due to non-availability of sanitary pads and 60.4% due to lack of private places to manage periods in schools. Will you consider reintroducing the free sanitary pass program? And what will you do to make schools conducive for girls in their periods? Thank you. Honorable Chair, my honorable colleague asked me if I look into it, and I will look into it. Thank you. Thank you. The last question. Oh, okay. I thought you had done. Very well. Uh, honorable Minister Designate, uh, there's been this long outstanding challenge of teachers refusing postings to rural schools and constantly seeking reposting to urban schools. What will you do to curb or put an end to this challenge? Thank you. Honorable Chair, issues about posting of teachers to schools across the country has always been a challenging one. And uh, this time around, what Ghana Education Service and uh, at the direction of the minister did was to post the uh, students or the uh, teachers directly to the schools where the vacancies are. And it, to a large extent, it is working compared to previous times when they were posted to the regions, and then the regions may refuse to post people to certain uh, schools with vacancies. So yes, it's not perfect, but the idea that when they get the appointment letter, the name of the school is on it, is helping to a large extent in solving this uh, rural vacancies challenge that has confronted us for a long time. Thank you. Honorable Minister, that brings me to an issue which is bothering me now. Several young people posted to schools under your new recruitment in communities where they cannot speak any of the local languages or dialects in the community. There are no facilities for even rentals. And indeed, one of them said when she went into the community, she couldn't get a single person to communicate in English with. So we were trying to communicate with sign language. <laughs> I understand that uh, under your new system, the basic schools, they're supposed to start teaching them in their local language. If that is so, how useful will such a teacher be to the school? Honorable Chairman, uh, issues of language and teacher placement and deployment is something that we have to take a serious look at. Our Ghana Education Service is doing what we call language mapping, making sure that we have enough teachers who can teach a specific language and then liaising with our uh, Winneba uh, in their language school to make sure, Jumaku, to make sure adequate teachers are trained. So yes, it's a challenge. 
And another challenge in, in the rural posting sometimes is also accommodation. So these are issues that we have to look at to make sure if we map the languages well, then it will not be a major challenge. But yes, given the multiplicity of languages spoken in this country, if you are not careful and you are not meticulous, uh, these challenges are bound to happen. But it's something that I've taken note of, and my team and I will seriously look into this so that we can avoid those situations. Thank you, sir. Yes, Eric. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, in 2020, the seventh parliament granted waiver of over $23 million for the importation of customized calculators for use by 2020 WASI candidates. Can the nominee indicate to us why the calculators did not arrive in the country before the exams? And where are the calculators now? Honorable yeah. Chair, uh, the calculators were ordered at the peak of the COVID-19 first wave, where various uh, logistical um, systems and uh, were in dire straits. So yes, there was a delay, but subsequently, the calculators have been received uh, by the Ghana Education Service for onward distribution to the various uh, senior high schools. Do you call them calculators or mathematical science instruments? Uh, it's a combination where uh, it enables an easy use during the WASI exam. Then my second question. Following up from what Honorable Ayaga asked, because of the scrutinization of the get fund receivables, your government had more resources for the provision of educational infrastructure than any other government that has come uh, to this country because of this scrutinization. Can you indicate to this committee where in this country did you start and complete one secondary school in the last four years? The Ministry. Honorable Chair, uh, during the last four years, there were a number of schools that had various uh, facilities at various stages uncompleted. Uh, we have to embark upon making sure that those facilities were completed so that students uh, would be able to find a classroom to learn in and to find a place uh, to study. In addition to that, a number of new schools um, are under construction. And if you talk about where a school has been completed, I will um, direct you to Boson Girls Senior High School uh, on the road between Kuntanasa in the Ashanti region and Bekwai. A uh, new school has been completed there. And a number of schools are under construction. So if you say in one school, that school happens to be my constituency. So it's not difficult for me to point it out to you. But I'll tell you this. If you look at the science schools that are under construction, if you look at the various e-blocks that we had to complete, in addition to the big ones that you did, and the fact that a number of e-blocks in order to ensure that they are operationalized have been given dormitory blocks and they are under construction, in Saura, Papuso, a number of places where um, e blocks are, are being given dorms so that we can effectively use it and use it to the benefit of Ghanaian children, as you and uh, as the previous government envisaged. Uh, so, in terms of infrastructure, yes, um, infrastructure development is on track. And I will tell you, if you look at the schools that are being built, they will be competitive. They look like schools you can um, find anywhere in the world. Thank you. 
Honorable nominee, in paragraph 369 of the 2019 budget, uh, Mr. Speaker, with your indulgence, I would like to quote for you to refresh your memory. Mr. Speaker, the National Population Council, MPC, in collaboration with other stakeholders, developed guidelines on comprehensive sexual education for incorporation into the national education curriculum. This was what was provided for in the budget. Subsequent to this, your ministry organized a workshop for some teachers to prepare them for the implementation of comprehensive sexuality education in Ghana. The good people of Ghana vehemently opposed to this policy and government decided to discontinue. But you recall that all the six countries that accepted to implement this comprehensive sexuality education had financial support from UNESCO, including Ghana. Can you tell this committee how much money did Ghana receive for the implementation of comprehensive sexuality education? And now that we have decided to discontinue, are we returning the money or are we going to put it into different use? On our chair, I happen to be the deputy minister in charge of our pre tertiary. So, what we are referring to will be within my domain. But I'll tell you this I have not seen any record of any monies received from UNESCO. Um, I haven't seen anything of that sort as a deputy minister in charge of that area of um, the education ministry. But are you aware that the UNESCO appointed a project supervisor to work in collaboration with your ministry for the actualization of this program? Honorable Chair, I'm not aware. Mr. Chairman, my last question. Lack of textbooks is an issue to be revisited later. So you don't worry. Let's move to another area. Yes. Lack of textbooks, as you know, affect effective academic work. In the last four years, did your ministry supply textbooks to primary and junior high schools, I mean basic schools in this country? Chair, my ministry embarked on a curricular reform, which meant that once the syllabi is approved by NACA, it will be widely circulated, distributed, so that private publishers will then take advantage of that and write books that will be suitable for use in our schools. Indeed, they did. NACA did actually review the books and then submitted to Ghana Education Service. As I speak with you, a second review is being done. And after that happens, the necessary procurement will be done. I'll tell you this. Our teachers understand them that without the new books, it will be difficult to teach. We're given uh, materials with which, printed materials with which they were able to execute the curriculum in a trial uh, phase one. So, yes, I'll be the first person to concede that we need to make sure there's timely uh, publishing and acquisition of books. But when you deal with the private sector, in the case of Ghana, where we rely on the private sector for publishing, sometimes it can impede the speed with which certain things are done. But it is being done, uh, Honorable Chair. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Honorable Dr. Yawidu I congratulate you on your nomination, the Minister for Education. There's been 
a long discussion on the double track system. Now, some have bastardized it, civil society organizations, acad academics, and educationists, everybody. Some have described it as a masterstroke, having regard to the increase in the number of enrollments following the free senior high school policy that was introduced in September 2017. Now, in your estimation, do you think that uh, without the double track, there is any other means through which these students would have gotten to go to school? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Honorable Chair, I will say that the question of double track will be left in the history books, and I believe posterity will be kind to those of us who believed in it. But I also say that the President promised that within a period of five to seven years, he will eliminate double track, and he's on course to do just that. Uh, when he promised, that was three years ago, this happened in Tamale, a very cool evening, Tamale evening, and the promise was made. Uh, three years ago, five to seven, that means now you have two, uh, two to five, and we're on track, as has been announced by the Agri Minister for Education. Um, first year students will only be a single track. We are not doing double entry for first year students this upcoming academic year. So we are making progress. And honorable chair, uh, that is what I was, can say about this question of double track. Mr. Chairman, my next question is on the basic education, basic school education. Uh, in your assessment of the basic school education as it is right now, are you satisfied that what we have is one of the best in the sub-region, if not in Africa? Having regard to where you come from, Honorable Chair, I'm not satisfied. I know we are making progress, but I'm in no way satisfied. I believe there's more to be done. Uh, if you look at the Ghana Accountability for Learning Outcomes project, we have secured over 200 million to support 10,000 uh, low performing busy schools. Uh, in terms of teacher training, teaching and learning materials acquisition, and a whole lot of things that needs to be done to turn around the 10,000 schools that are not are doing well. So following on from that, I believe we have to then begin to look at middle schools or junior high schools. Invariably, they happen to be our weakest link. So you look at the primary, and uh, junior high schools, strengthening junior high schools so that they can truly serve as a secondary institution, thinking with the high schools. And I believe when that is done, then you are actually creating a pipeline uh, from KG, primary, junior high to high school, and tertiary, and that will serve the country very well. Thank you very much, Tanya uh, My last question, it's a very harmless one. Uh, I have looked at the 2020 manifesto of the MPP from pages 51 to 59. I can count about 39 commitments in the 2016 elections in the last manifesto, which have been fulfilled. Now, these, in my opinion, are delectable credentials that have been achieved. Do you feel intimidated by the work that has been done by the gentleman to my left, the Honorable Agoi Minister for Education? Do you think that you can step in his shoes nicely? Okay. Uh, Honorable Chair, I, I haven't looked at his shoes, but I think uh, we wear the same size of shoes. <laughs> yes. 
So I don't think it will be difficult for me to step into his shoes. Uh, but I will, I will tell you this. He has laid a foundation, uh, erected the walls. I'm going to take it from the lintel and put roofs on it uh, so that we can truly transform the education system of this country as we came to inherit it. Thank you, uh, Mr. Okay. Yes, yeah, Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, we closed down schools for so many months. Recently, the president asked for schools to be reopened. Schools have since been reopened. But recently, we've been reporting about infection, I mean COVID infection. And the Ghana Medical Association has come out strongly, asking government to close down schools because of the infection. What is your position on this? That Ghana Medical Association is calling on government to close down schools so that we can protect our children. Honorable Chairman, um... I'm very pleased that my honorable colleague has asked me a question that is so dear to many on the hearts and minds of parents and teachers. I will say one thing. Countries that have open schools, you really have to look at the dynamics of every situation and measures that you put in place to protect the children. One important measure or indicator is ensuring that the school is not breeding grounds for the virus. To the extent that the school becomes a place where the children are safer uh, compared to the community, then you do not close the schools. If you are able to en um, um, ensure that protocols are followed, you are able to ensure that the school has the highest level of cleanliness and uh, disinfection, um, sanitizing, um, then you are actually creating a safe haven for the children. So why do you close a safe haven? On the other hand, if the school is becoming a super spreader site, uh, then of course you have to revisit the idea of school opening or closure. The virus is in the community. Can we make sure that the school being a very disciplined environment, can we ensure that it's safer for the children to be at school? If the answer is yes, based on what the Ghana Education Service is currently doing, supported by the Ghana Health Service, I will say that the schools are safer environments, and therefore, I will not say we should close down schools. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, in 2019, the government promised to construct affordable housing for teachers in this country. What is the status of this project? How many housing units have been constructed so far? Honorable Chair, I did not get the first part in terms of specific, specific where the government made a commitment. I said in 2019 budget. 2020. 19 budget. 2019. Government promised to construct affordable housing for teachers specifically. Ah. For teachers. No, I haven't seen it. Please, in the budget, please. Honorable, um, what is the. Do you, do you have it? Can you refer to it? I think Eric has a yes, budget yes, copy yes, of the budget. Yes, yes. We'll move to another one. So, move to another one. He will guide you. He will assist you. So, okay. 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 I'll come back to you. Mr. Chairman, the next issue has to do with Lancentia exams. The new routine teachers are compelled to write Lancentia exams. And it means those who are not able to pass don't get employment. This is a concern for parents and the students. Are you considering doing something about it?
students are calling for cancellation of this translation exam. Do you agree with them? On our chair, translation exam within the context of our tertiary education system is needed on for two reasons. One, it helps you know which of the colleges of education are doing a fantastic job educating the youth who are going to be the future teachers of the country. In addition to that, it also allows you to assess the, uh, the competence of the, uh, the future teachers. Based on the data that has been, I am privy to, um, the teachers are doing very well in terms of the pass rate the first time and then they have the second time, some do it about three times and then they pass it. So, Honorable Chair, I believe um, the line signature exam at this point is performing a very important function. So I will not advocate for the cancellation uh, of the line signature exam, which is something that, that the Education Regulatory Bodies Act prescribed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, chairman, the Honorable Nomine is quoted to have said that there will be no review of PTA's participation in free senior high school. There will be no review of PTA, Parent Teachers Association, participation in uh, there will be no review of Student Teachers Association participation in free senior high school. Mr. Chairman, ETA has been with us for a long time. When we go to most secondary schools, it support in the infrastructure uh, provisions. For the advent of free senior high schools, government has stopped ETA from, support, uh, I mean, provision of infrastructure in the schools. That's why you said that there will not be review of PTA participation in three senior high schools. Will you consider this your position? Because they support infrastructure in our senior high schools. Honorable Chair, maybe what I said has been taken out of context. Honorable Chair, PTAs are a very important part of our education system. What uh, was not allowed to happen uh, with the advent of free senior high school was levying of students. Um, before free senior high school, parents paid what was called development levy. And in addition to that, they paid for electricity, uh, water, all those things were paid by parents. With the advent of free senior high school, the government decided to absorb all these uh, fees that were levied against the student that parents were paying, whether it was electricity, it was water, government absorbed. And government also absorbed what the PTAs were charging as development levy. So, the question is, if government has absorbed the development levy, PTAs can use that money to complete uncompleted buildings because this is the money that parents were being levied for development in the schools. And if the government is paying, why should the parents be levied again? So PTAs have a central role to play in our schools. And nobody has said that PTAs should not exist in our secondary schools. What we have said is that you cannot levy the children again because the government has absorbed the development levy. Mr. Chairman, I earlier spoke about affordable housing promised by the government. Actually, it, it yes, was I'm in the 2017 ahead. budget, page 589. It's information I read. Government recognizes that quality teaching is critical to the provision of quality education. Our policy to improve educational outcomes 
will therefore be teacher-centered. Over the next four years, we have programs to support and motivate teachers to discharge their duties effectively through affordable housing scheme for teachers. Government will engage with NAT, NAGRAT, SNIT, and other housing delivery agents to facilitate the provision of affordable housing scheme for teachers across the country. The government is in its fifth year. How many affordable houses have you bought for teachers in this country? Because it says in the next four years. And the next four years is over. This is 2017. 2017. 2017. Four years is over. How many houses have you built for teachers in this country? Honorable Ahi, what was the word that government will build? That was your question. The government said it will build houses. Is that what you asked? Within four years. Is that what you it asked? It will build affordable housing for teachers. The four years has elapsed. I'm asking how many housing units has the government built for teachers in this country? Honorable, please ask. <laughs> Honorable Chair, I'm grateful to my honorable colleague for reminding me of something that was said in 2017. I'm going to find a copy of my budget statement, and uh, this is something I can, uh, somebody who cares about teacher welfare, I'm going to be a champion of that. And then I'll come back and report to you. But at this time, as you, as you put it, uh, 2017, I think it was prophetic that we're going to be 2021, that's the four years. But I'm going to pursue this and follow up. Thank you, sir. Mr. Shama, he's an omnitelliness. You have been in the museum for four years. Honorable sir. And this he, promise honorable was done four, four years ago. Hmm? Four years, he was not the minister. He, he was the deputy him. minister. Yes, but he was not the minister. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, in any this case, is a, this is not you to you, sir. This is supplementary. You know, all due deference to you, what you read and mm. the question you asked are not the same. What? What you read said <laughs> it will again. facilitate yes. accommodation, but you asked government will build. They are not the same. No, the government said you build affordable housing for teachers. Yeah, Should I read it again? It doesn't mean it will build. It will high rent. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, the government didn't provide this paragraph in vain. The government understood when it said it was build affordable housing. So if the minister is telling us that nothing has been done so far, so be it. You haven't done anything. In the last four years, not even one unit has been built. Is that what you mean? It's a supplementary question. Honorable Chair, I am going to look for a copy of the budget uh, statement, read it carefully, and as I said, uh, I'm very concerned about teacher welfare, so it's something that I'll pull up on. Honorable, thank you. So what I'm saying is that in the last four years, you didn't build, you couldn't facilitate any affordable housing as promised in the 2017 budget. Is that what you are telling us? You are not going to look for your budget to cross-check whether you have been able to build some or not, or you have facilitated some or not. Is that what you are telling me? Supplementary question. Is that what you mean?
Oh, no, I'm so I thought I had cut you off because I was not paying attention. You are taking advantage, Shura. <laughs> Very well, please answer the last one from him. Honorable Chair, as you rightly pointed out, I was a Deputy Minister, and of course, I was at the Ministry. But all that I'm saying is that this is something I'm going to seriously look into, uh, so that what could not be done, we can take steps to make sure the right thing is done for our teachers. Thank you, sir. Yeah, there's nothing here. Yeah, then I'm going Thank you, member. You will be last. That's my advice. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Honorable nominee, on teacher licensure exam, I listened to one of your interviews and you indicated that, I listened to one of your interviews and you indicated that whether you are coming from a private college of education or a public college of education, the common denominator is that exam. And that once you pass that exam, the Ghana Education Service will post you to a school. As I speak to you right now, your last posting was without graduates who have the teacher licensure exam but attended private colleges of education. Why is that so? And what plans are you making to ensure that graduates from private colleges of education with the teacher licensure exam will be posted? Thank you. Honorable Chair, when I get the opportunity uh, to serve this country as a Minister for Education, uh, this is an issue that I'm going to look into. Uh, because I know that during the past few years, uh, those teachers were posted. So I'm going to uh, talk to Ghana Education Service so that they can brief me on the current uh, status of teachers who went to private colleges of education. Thank you, Madam. Thank you very much. Next is the reopening of schools. I am of the opinion that we really put our children at great risk when schools were reopened. Because you agree with me, honorable nominee, that schools reopened before no masks were sent to the schools. As I speak to you right now, a lot of schools, I am not even zeroing it to Techima North, that is not fair, the whole Ghana. A lot of schools don't have even the thermometer gun, they don't have Veronica buckets, they don't have sanitizers, but our children are in school. What are you going to do to ensure that students or ch our children in schools are safe in terms of the PPEs and the other uh, things that they need to ensure that the viruses do not spread in the schools, like Veronica Bucket and the things that I've indicated? Honorable Chair, I spoke with the Ghana Education Service and they assured me that in few instances where delivery was going to be a time the military was involved in making sure the items get to the intended destination so that our children will use the necessary PPEs and be protected. At uh, the moment I leave here, I'm going to follow up because I, I was, and uh, with the briefing given to me, I was assured that initially there were challenges, but the military stepped in and they have distributed the PPEs uh, to schools across the country. So I would definitely I look into this issue that you have brought to my attention today. My last one, and it's a follow-up. We are all trying to make sure that our children are safe in schools. Whereas you are trying hard to help children in public schools, take notice that there are children in private schools too. Don't have the idea of private schools in Accra. Think of private schools in the deprived communities. They are not the middle class private schools that you see here. So I'm encouraging you to look at private schools in deprived communities and also assist them in the PPEs. Thank you. Honorable Chair, distribution of PPEs since uh, the beginning of school opening was done across the board to all schools. 
of, uh, whether you are public or private. So that is what has been uh, done over the whole academic year when the abbreviated um, openings were done with the final year students and then second year students at senior high school level. Private schools were part of the distribution list and it will continue to be so. Uh, so far the PP is concerned and this is what has been directed by the president and we intend to carry uh, through with that order ensuring that every student irrespective of whether they are in private school or high school will have access to the necessary PPEs uh, for self-protection. Yeah. I see you need before ranking number. That's what I'm on by. Or other way. Very well. All right. Um, thank you, uh, Honorable Chair. Honorable nominee, um, I'll start with a question that you have attempted to answer twice. The first one was by Honorable Ni Lante Vanderpoy, and I think uh, Chairman also came uh, with a supplementary. I am, first of all, a trained teacher, and I was a leader of one of the teacher unions, I mean teacher training unions at the time. And I do know that we have only guidelines with GES. And for me, the question that was asked relate to whether or not we have a policy for posting teachers in this country. Because what I know, that is the practice, is that the GES have guidelines where it is suggested that 60% of teachers who graduate are posted to the primary, 40 to JHS, and the regional directors are to send to the districts with the most need, and district directors are to assist with accommodation, consider teachers with health problems, females to be posted in you know, urban areas, and male new teachers who did not choose the regions they are sent to, to also be sent to towns. I mean, these are just guidelines. But then, the issue of L1 to L2, instructing using the local language, comes to play if there is a policy. Because in that policy, then it will show how teachers who understand instruction to be done in the L1 to the L2 should be posted. It will guide the posting of teachers, so to speak, because you want to improve L1, I mean the teaching in the local language, so to speak. So the question to you is, do we have a policy that guides teacher posting and in some cases recruitment, let me put it that way, of teachers in this country? Honorable Chair, um, a comprehensive teacher policy uh, is at the final stages with various stakeholder consultation and participation, and it's being done through the National Teaching Council. Uh, so very soon, that policy will then dictate the issues that you have uh, brought up. So it's very important that we ensure um, a speedy uh, development and finish to this policy so that all these issues that you've brought up can then be taken care of under that comprehensive policy. There's also a problem with teachers who have gone for further studies and the problem with readmitting them into GES. We also have issues of teachers 